This is the poet in the poem from the Library of Congress. I'm Grace Cavalieri, and Sandra Beasley is with us. She has a new book, Made to Explode, but she has such mastery, I promise she'll keep it all together, and we're going to hear an opening poem. Hi, Sandra. Hello. Wonderful to be with you today, Grace. Let's hear it. All right, uh, let me read the opening poem from my collection Made to Explode, which is called Heirloom. Just in case you've ever wondered about the origin story of Orida tater tots, uh, with a little swerve through a bit of uh, family history, our likes and dislikes. Heirloom. Lo, 12 children born to a woman named Thankful in Nampa, by the border between Oregon and Idaho, or as it will be remembered, or Ida. Lo, two of her sons drive to Miami, not knowing if their plan will work. Lo, what were once waste scraps fed to the cows, now repackaged. The fry shavings sliced, spiced, and oiled. Lo, a chef at the Fountain Blue takes the bribe. Lo, tater tots are dished onto the tables of the 1954 National Potato Convention and soon enshrined in the freezers of America. Three decades later, the golden age of my childhood is a foil lined tray plattered with or Ida product, maybe salt, maybe nothing but hot anticipation of my fingertips. Lo, my mother is a great cook, and lo, my grandmother is a terrible one. But on tin foil planes, they are equal. I need you to understand why my father will never enjoy an heirloom tomato glistening, layered in basil. Put away your brandy wines, your Cherokee purples, your green zebras. Lo, as with spinach, as with olives, he tastes only the claustrophobia his mother unleashed from cans to feed four children on a budget. We talk little of this. Lo, what is cooked to mush. Lo, what is peppered to ash. Lo, the flavor rendered as morning chore that this too is a form of love. Oh my, so much going on there. This book is really a testament, a cultural testament to our times and to past times and to your time, Sandra. And I'm very interested in that poem, especially because you are quite obsessed with food. And we know from your past work that you've made a career out of your allergies which have become poetic icons. So this is so interesting to me that you should have given us the history of tater tots. What ever got into you? Well, I had this chance to edit an anthology on Southern food traditions. Mm. And you're, you're by nature drawing a lot of boundary lines, trying to figure out for the sake of this anthology, what is Southern, what is tradition, what are the spaces that, you know, these poems are going to operate in. So invariably for my own work, my mind went to what I wasn't seeing, which for me was fast food, casual food, uh, less healthy food, less organic food, you know, and wanting to write the poems that celebrated what for me were maybe not the most traditional things, right? But they, they were necessary uh, space holders in the culture of my childhood. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I don't know what I would have done without eating Orida hash browns every single morning. Oh, amazing. <laughs> they are American icons. And this book is about so much more, really. Um, what bothered you so much and obsessed you so much about our time in history that made you write these poems? 
Well, that's a particularly interesting question because this was a book that insisted on being written uh, because what I really wanted to write was a poem, was a set of poems that were light and humorous and kind of uh, in, in headspace, going back maybe to the mode of I was the jukebox, my second collection. But, you know, I live in Washington, D.C. I live uh, very close to the Capitol, very close to the White House. And those were just not the poems I could write in the last five years. I hear uh, you. <laughs> history insisted on stamping its foot. There is that sense in this book of intensity and purpose. Absolutely. I want everyone to know who you are. And Sandra is the author of this new book, Made to Explode, Count the Waves, I was the jukebox, which was the winner of the Barnard Women Poets Prize, Theories of Falling, winner of the New Issues Poetry Prize, and Don't Kill the Birthday Girl, Tales from an Allergic Life, a Disability Memoir. There's lots of humor in all of these. She edited Vinegar and Char, verse from the Southern Foodways Alliance. She lives in Washington. Now, here's the interesting thing about this bio. It's about 1,000 lines too short. She's won a dozen awards. She's translated a book. She's taught at American University, Tampa University, but she gives us three lines. So please go to Wikipedia. And now Sandra, give us a poem. <laughs> this next poem is called Winsel's Oyster House. And one of the things reflected in Count the Waves is I spent much of the last 10 years traveling. And that has brought me all kinds of adventures, great meals, but I became interested whenever possible of finding the story be behind the story. Huh. So even, though this, even though this poem is called Winsel's Oyster House, and that's a very popular destination, what I'm really talking about is the family that lived in the house before it became that restaurant. Winsel's Oyster House. Before six seats and a trough of oysters, before Jay Oliver slathers the wall in homespun, Charles W. Peters sells squash here and canned beans. He sells bed frames and dressers and side tables, insurance against rising waters. He sells whatever will send nine daughters and sons through mm -hmm. college. In 1891, a black man can build two stories of Clapperd for $2,000, can aspire to his own furniture company, can preside over the Mutual Aid Association, can march with 4,000 men and four brass bands under the Emancipation League's auspices. He builds two blocks from the Creole fire station, which keeps fast horses, racetrack rejects, because the first fire truck to arrive on the scene is the only one whose men get paid. <laughs> Fifty some years later, a merchant marine offered West Indies by way of Mobile. Crab lumped, layered in fine chopped onion, and the kiss of Wesson oil, and the slap of iced water and how God means for salad to be served on a saltine. We chow down in the last all wood joint on Dauphin. The secret is in the cider, vinegar, how a hundred jaws of minor angels macerate the hall. Such a perfectly made poem. You start with a location, a locus with detail then you hark back in time, then you flash forward in time. And this construction is really what the movement is in the poem. Could I apprentice my students to this poem? Is this a good <laughs> poem to teach such an, art, such an art to start, to move back, to move forward? That is such a Sandra thing. Well, I, I'm so flattered to hear you say that because I think that for me, this is my fourth collection. And one of the pleasures of being at this point in my career is to write poems that swerve and curve and pivot um. and to really to make sure the poems do a lot, even though occasionally there's the welcome refresher of a short poem or a concise poem. But I'm really interested in that musculature in that kind of uh, propulsive energy. You've got it. In this poem, I think, well, it's, these are prose poems, actually. So it's really 
interesting to find the lyricism in the sprung line, but I will use this poem to just care for, as a blueprint. I mean, there's nothing wrong with that to have students start someplace, go back with a valid, with valid information and then flash forward and to learn what you, I will call the Sandra swerve. <laughs> that's a new, that's a new poetic terminology. Let's hear it more. We'll see what we can do with it. Well, because writing about food invariably took me to writing about history and because writing about history, particularly growing up as I did in, in Virginia and now living in DC for many years, has to, it, it forces me to think about uh, race, to think about cultural inheritance. I want to read a poem that kind of takes that head on. Uh, I wanted to write poems in this book that both, uh, in some cases, confronted conspiracy to and complicitness to Black pain, uh, also moments of Black celebration, as in the family of the, the, the poem I just read. I was very interested in thinking about whiteness. I think we've been asked by poets to think about whiteness. And I thought, well, one thing that often comes up is the idea that whiteness is a construct. So this next poem, which is literally called My Whitenesses with a kind of purposeful play on witnesses, I thought, well, what are the parts of my body, not in terms of my skin tone, but what is the literal whiteness of my body? Mm. What on my white would, what on my body would, would apparition as being the color white? And what can I do with those elements that somehow speaks to this larger construct? My whitenesses. Whiteness as my body's spent currency, hair that holds no melanin, which I pluck out, an overlong fingernail that I tear away, what once blistered collapsed flat to my heel. And what then? Skin picked, flicked under my bed, strands dropped to tile, the keratin crescents folded, tucked in couch crevice. My performative strip of self still trashing up the place. Down by Richmond, how you pronounce a thing sets stake in the land. Do you elaborate a tribe's pow height? Or does 300 years of muscle memory guide the tongue? Po White Creek, Po White Parkway. One man uses cracker as absolution, as proof of brotherhood, while another uses cracker because someone three great grands ago cracked a whip. Mm. Virginia, my ghosts need gathering. Come to the table and sit, God damn it, sit. Wow, you know, I get the intensity just by looking at the page. And so those line lengths come from something in your blood. Something your blood is doing inside of you makes those line lengths. And that makes the intensity. And tell me how you came to that burst of emotion at the end. Mm, I, I couldn't, it, there needed to be a reckoning of some kind. And I, I you know, and it's interesting how uh, I started with these constructs of the body, but then this language of Virginia, the idea of this kind of play on the various ways to pronounce these Richmond and Central Virginia place names, it just forced itself into the poem. And I and I just wanted, you know, and there's a little bit of language play here. There's a little bit. Oh, of there's a lot of language. Oh, rhyme, yeah, I know. <laughs> and really, you know, I was realizing uh, later, maybe a little nod to Sylvia Plath too. I think actually a little bit of her uh, Lady Lazarus, the idea of the the trash of the body, the annihilation of the body. Um, and I I only mention that because I think there's. I think those poems from that point in her career are a lot about self-laceration. And well, I think it's a poem that's dealing with that. The body is a great tradition for poets and even Anne Sexton did a lot of liberation with her poems and the body. And this takes on a very big subject. It reminds me of that work of art that is now being displayed about the map of the runaway slaves made by human black hair 
as dots on the map because the hair holds the DNA of all the ancestry. So this artist has used Tufts her own hair to plot a huge map of the runaway slaves saying that it's all there. Ancestry is right there. And that is what this poem is about. I mean, it's your whiteness that you are really plucking out and taking a look at and saying, what do we do with this? You know, what, do, what can I do with this? But I think the looking is a really very noble gesture. I think it's like being a witness. Instead of turning away from all this, you go right into it. I think that's your job. I'm trying, I'm trying. And it's a constant balance because I think the moment you start asking to be rewarded for it, you, <laughs> you've surrendered your, you know, your, you quit. the nobility quote unquote makes me nervous because I, I think that it's, it's important for it to be a gesture of humility and to, to kind of um, just to understand that this is the work I need to do. And then, and then my work is to listen and amplify. And that's really something I think about a lot as a, as a, as a professional poet is where are the places where my job is not to get my voice in the mix. My job is to listen and my job is to lift up the voices of other folks. You cannot be asking for any reward in your poetry or you would not take so many risks. You cannot, you cannot count on any reward because you're just a risk taker. <laughs> so you just put it out there and you think where it lands, that's where it lands. So that's not reward asking. So come on, keep going. Sandra Beasley, <laughs> new book. It is called Made to Explode. And here's it. Beautiful, beautiful, arresting cover. Did you, did you have something to do with that? Uh, you know, they, they uh, I originally had a different title and I'd hope to use some of my husband's artwork, but that will be a future book. This one, they wanted something, they wanted something that punched and I loved how the phrase made to explode could be seen as a gesture of both celebration or violence, depending on, it could be fireworks, could be gunfire. Oh, that's um, so interesting. Oh. And so I, I think the, the image that they gave it is appropriately ambiguous. <laughs> oh, that's very interesting. And I think your husband's work would call for pastel poetry. I will, I'll, I'll sneak you a, an image later. <laughs> okay. Sandra Beasley is here and I couldn't be happier. Let's hear more. So this next poem, Kiss Me, uh, is very much operating in the reality of DC as being the nation's capital, where all of these very important uh, people circulate as symbolic figures of power, but they're also just people and they need to do things like go to restaurants and go to music and go to plays and museums. So you'll hear a cameo by Ruth Bader Ginsburg in this poem that it was inspired by literally uh, a cameo that I experienced in real life. The other thing that people don't usually realize is that the Sandra Day O'Connor cameo in this poem was also inspired by a real life path crossing. Uh, so this is called um, Kiss Me. <laughs> Ruth Bader Ginsburg sits in the 19th row of my heart. While on stage, a woman has been conscribed to the shape of a shrew. The actress has 40 carat eyes, an aquiline nose, her shoulders slight, her waist small enough. She is spanked over our hero's knee. Everyone is laughing except the conductor who must steady his baton and the house manager who has seen it before and the actors directed instead to be aghast, agape, gawking, <laughs> agog, whatever Cole Porter rhymes with dismayed, and Ginsburg, who adjusts the pearl clipped to her ear. She curls the program in her lap. This is tiring, attending theaters of the heart. She doesn't relish it as Sandra Day O'Connor did, sipping Prosecco at the intermission of Corgi and Bess. The gangster's soft shoe, reminding us to brush up on our Shakespeare. The actress sings, I am ashamed that women are so simple. Soon, Kate will be tamed. That's how we know the ending is happy. Now, you are the queen of invisible bridges. You have many invisible bridges. Happily, yours happen to land on the other side 
because you just do enough, never too much for us to get information. I mean, there are like three clues that this is Kiss Me Kate. There's the title, there's a word Kate, there's something at the end, but you really, I had to read it twice. And that is what your gift is. You just are the queen of the invisible bridge. You just start it and you let everyone cross, come across that bridge from the other side. And by God, it never, you never miss in the middle. But do you, are you aware of how much you ask the reader and how much you trust the reader? Yeah. You trust the reader enormously. I mean, you make us proud to be readers. Oh, well, I think that, I honestly believe that part of the social value of poetry is the idea that the reader helps complete the poem and that there is joy in that process. This poem, the very first time it was published was called Kiss Me Kate. It was oh. put in to an anthology. And one of the things I said to the anthology editors was, look, I wanna pull off the word Kate. I don't want it to be the play's name. And they said, but is that, do, you, do we risk losing them? I said, yes, but I'm also really interested that the phrase kiss me, which is associated with the language of seduction and you know the invitation of that, I want the reader to receive that at first unfettered and not be thinking of a particular play, but just that open invitation, kiss me. And, and then to see Ruth Bader Ginsburg right off the bat and have to work like, with that. <laughs> did you actually see her in the audience or was that imagined? No, no, I did not. It was a rampant rumor in the, in the Shakespeare theater that night. And I saw someone of her height and hair, but I didn't, you know, I wasn't going to burst into the middle of a row and, and check her ID. <laughs> well, we won't, tell, we won't tell anybody because it is, she's there for us in this poem and she'll be in this poem forevermore throughout history. She'll be sitting in that seat when we're long gone. It's uh, amazing, it's amazing. Yeah, oh, I'm so glad you've changed the title because a lesser poet would have not. Because well, I, a lesser poet is scared. Well, no, I mean, I just think, I also write nonfiction. And so I have a genre where I'm trying to be absolutely crystalline in my meaning. I think with poetry, I'm more comfortable. It becomes the space where I can be playful to the point of, of you know, running the risk of mystery or misunderstanding. <laughs> and it is play. It is play. And that's where the light comes from. Sandra Beasley, we want more light. We want more poetry. Well, to mention play is a perfect way to, to read a Sestina. That's the perfect setup because the Sestina's challenge is that you read a stanza uh, that sets up six end words, and then you have to reuse each of those six end words in a prescribed pattern. So particularly with contemporary Sestinas, that might involve punning, homophones, you know, like all kinds of play, and you'll hear that. Um, this is a very DC poem. The epigraph is dedicated to Marion Shepilov Barry Jr., 1936 to 2014. Uh, Marion Barry, famed longtime politician in DC. The title is American Rome, which is one of many of the nicknames given to DC over the years. Uh, and you'll also, if you're a baseball fan or a basketball fan, you'll hear some little nods to, to that world in here as well. Marion Barry, Jams of Washington State. I thought they were mocking this city. Take a mayor and boil his sugar down, spoon spreadable, sweet. We take presidents and run them in a game's fourth inning stretch. We take bullets and turn them to sea dogs. Remember that vote, that ballot? Sea dogs, dragons, stallions, express. The Washington Wizards no, was no more or less of a stretch. We wave gavels like wands in this city. We're the small town in which a president can plant some roses. Each time I sit down to try and say goodbye, all I write down is dear city. My neighbor walks his dogs past a monument to a president's terrier, Fala, forever bronzed. Washington has no J Street, no Z, Yet the city maps attend to 50 states and a stretch of five blocks northeast metro track, a stretch named Puerto Rico Avenue. 
bow down to the unmapped names, Chocolate City, Simple City. <laughs> ben serves up chili dogs through a riot and Walter Washington is the first and last time a president picks our mayor. The truth is presidents come and go four or eight years at a stretch. Barry says, I'm yours for life, Washington. Mm. Emperor Marion, who could get down with Chuck Brown. Later, reporters will dog his bitch set me up, his graft. Dear city, will you let me claim you as my city? To love you is to defy precedent. Your quadrants hustle like a pack of dogs around the hydrant capital. They stretch and paw, they yap and will not settle down. Traffic, the berry to Washington's jam. For city miles, Barry's motorcade stretched. We laid him among vice presidents down. The dogs seek Congress in Washington. <sighs> Oh, that is such a tricky line. I know, I know. Congressional Cemetery is actually the name, of course. It's also a, a, a major cemetery stretch that's renowned for its, its dog walking culture. So I'm not trying to trivialize uh, Barry's gravestone being in that setting, but it's, it's, a, it's a real nexus. Um, but also seeking Congress as a sexual act. Oh, I know. <laughs> oh, I thought you did. Oh, I'm not telling the author what she knows, but you know, the, it, that was an inevitable poem, but is it the only poem about Marion Barry maybe? I hope not. No, I would bet that Kenny Carroll has one. I would bet that maybe Dwayne Betts has one. I, I know there are others. I wonder out because there. it's yeah. it was essential for you talking about your time and place where you are shining so much light. But Marion Barry is truly worthy of a, a lot of your. I think a lot of your nonfiction maybe because here's the disgraced, beloved. Marion Barry, who did so much for Ward 8 and who had such a constituency, a cult that absolutely adored him. And yet he, in and out of prison, he always rose to the top like cream. Major force for the arts, major force for arts funding. I mean, how, so many, many good things. how many different initiatives, you know, in DC. Yeah, it's, it's really, it's a complicated thing. Now, part of the one, part of the thing that this poem is wrestling with is I can't get too deep into DC history before someone says to me, oh, what quadrant were you born in? And the answer is I wasn't. I was born in Northern Virginia. I was born in Fairfax and grew up in Vienna. So I'm always kind of wrestling with my desire and my, my pride in being a DC poet and the fact that the, at the end of the day, I can't change the fact that I was not born here. So I'm always that, that kind of that dear city recurring, like, will you, oh. can I even, you? Can I even but, write this poem? Oh, interesting. I didn't know I, I sit, see you, we all see you as a Washington DC poet, but you've lived here quite a long time though. Oh yeah, and my, my father worked in the city in Georgetown and downtown. So I, I always grew up uh, coming in, in and around. I mean, I, I, my, my culture like of my childhood is deeply embedded here. We would do Thanksgiving out on the water, you know, at Phillips or Hogate's now, now known as the wharf. We would go to shows at arena. I mean, it's, this is where I grew up. No but, question. Yeah. You amplify the city. It doesn't matter where you were birthed, believe me. Let us have two poems together without me interrupting. What yeah, a thought. Perfect. No, no, no. You're just helping me spin out my ideas. I'm a talker. That's part of what we have in common, Grace. <laughs> um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read two poems together, Card Table and Vow. They speak to building a household. They speak to a marriage that's past that first flush of lust and it's more about commitment and shared time. Oh, it didn't pass the lust, did it? <laughs> My, America wants to know. <laughs> a little bit of lust in the sparks in the second one. Um, and the, uh, and, and, but I say that in part because it opens, card table opens with some elegy. Uh, it recognizes the, the gift of someone who's no longer with us and how that gift helped me build the household that I'm part of now. Card table. A practical gift for moving to the city. Good cherry squared around black vinyl, four long legs that could fold within itself as a greyhound does, disappearing into a nap. Just big enough for a bridge match if I'd ever had four people willing to kiss knees. 
just big enough to let me call a corner of that S Street studio my breakfast nook, stacked with a week's worth of newspapers while I ate cereal cross-legged on my futon. Just big enough to pull out every few years and complain how small the table was, too crowded as a desk, too low for my chairs. In January, we stared at the strange space wedged between two kitchen doorways. Might as well try the card table. We stacked onions there, then potatoes, then tomatoes and peaches, and it became the chopping table, stirring table, serving table. Now, the first morning she is gone, I see a wipe in the vinyl where a hot dish burned through and realize I forgot to ask for anything. A ring, her sheet music. So what I have is this reminder that she too was once a girl in a city and that she knew I'd always need a table. <gasps> That is, um, so the, the closing lines in particular give due to my, my grandmother, Jean, there. Um, but now I'm going to switch and, and read a poem called The Vow. It actually opens with an epigraph from Chaucer, a couple of lines from Chaucer that, that speak of this, um, this uh, uh, challenge that married couples might face. Those lines say, but never for us the flitch of bacon, though, that some may win it at, in Essex at Dunmo. The vow, but never for us the flitch of bacon, though, that some may win in Essex at Dunmo. So promises the old wives' tale, a covenant according to Chaucer, that if tomorrow I trek to Dunmo Church and swear before God and congregation, not a fight, no single quarrel, in 366 days, not even once wishing to be unmarried to you, that hog is ours for the taking. My love, what limp victory that would be. Sweet silence of perfect agreement as we swing a pork trophy between us, walking the many miles home, the fat back one, the battle, lost. I reserve my right to a good spat, to the meat's spit in flame. I take joy in choosing you again and again. Amen. I choose him too. And I didn't even, I don't even wake up next to him, but you have the top of the heap. You do have a prince there. What a couple, the dream team. Yes, now let us hear a final poem. Thank you. Uh, since I've read poems in celebration of food, I do want to read a poem from this wheelhouse of food allergies. Uh, this is marking the fact that many people will bring me uh, an appearance of food allergies in popular culture, a TV show, a movie, a book, where often I promptly discover that the key appearance of said allergies is to kill someone off. <laughs> this is wonderful. <laughs> Death by Chocolate. A man wants my take on his novel, where a wife dies with a peanut in her mouth after we've met her husband in the act with his secretary in the passenger seat of a late life convertible. A man wants my take on his novel, where the husband's marital issues are solved by her anaphylactic collapse after he serves her takeout spiked with a cashew and for another 300 pages, he wonders, was it an accident or did I? No. Somewhere out there, a man is writing a novel about a chef with a taste for adding shrimp paste to curry and his unsuspecting shellfish allergic wife and I will be asked for my take on it. I have been offered dozens of takes on my own death. Suggestions abound. Death by ice cream, death by cake, death by cucumber, though that would take a while, perhaps gazpacho as a shortcut. Death by mango, death by Spanish omelet, 
death by dairy, an abstraction sexy to someone who has never side-eyed cream brought out slopping toward the coffee, who has never felt histamine's palm at her throat, who says cheese makes life worth living. <laughs> These wives, I get you, women who did not grow up aspiring to be a plot device. We almost die a lot, or we die a lot, almost. We're over it. Our mouths have more to say. Mm. 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 The inimitable Sandra Beasley. That is a Tom Stoppard play, if ever there were one in a poem. <laughs> And this is the poet in the poem from the Library of Congress. <laughs> the program is produced by Forest Woods Media Productions, post-production by Mike Turpin, MET Studios. We wish to thank the Library of Congress for making this program possible. Funding is provided by the Rivada Foundation of the Logan family and the Sinipid Fund. And we thank you very much. I am Grace Cavalieri. Our engineer is Mike Turpin. We love you, Sandra. <laughs>